This episode of Epicenter Bitcoin is brought to you by Ledger, makers of the Ledger Nano hardware wallet. Have peace of mind in knowing your private keys are protected by industry standard physical security. Go to ledgerwallet.com to learn more and use the offer code EB09 at checkout to get 10% off your first order. And by Shapeshift. With no account or sign-up required, it's the easiest way to buy and sell Counterparty, Gems, Swarm, Dogecoin, and other leading cryptocurrencies. Go to shapeshift.io and instantly convert your altcoins and to discover the future of cryptocurrency exchanges. Hi, welcome to Epicenter Bitcoin, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global cryptocurrency revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture. And my name is Brian Fabian Crane. Uh, we're here today with Rodolfo Novak. Uh, many of you probably have heard of his startup. He's the CEO and founder or co-founder of CoinKite, their Canadian company. And uh, as we were talking before and looking at the website, one thing became very apparent to us. They are probably the Bitcoin company with the most features of anyone. So it's quite insane, all the things that they've done. So Rodolfo, uh, thanks so much for joining us today. Hello, thanks for having me. So for those who don't know about CoinKite, or perhaps let's, let's take a step back before that even. Can you tell us a little bit about how you got involved in Bitcoin originally? Sure. So I think it was uh, mid or late 2011, uh, my current co-founder and CTO uh, came across the paper and, uh, and you know, he shared it with me and we sort of you know, found this thing amazing. And uh, we, we started a project called BTC Look. It was uh, a, a visualization of the blockchain. Uh, you know, that was, that was a fun project. And then sort of kind of like, okay, great. So now let's get people on it. <laughs> let's build a project to, to, to get the Bitcoin going. And, uh, and that kind of got us into, into the, the terminals and, and coinkite.com, the wallet. So when we first met, uh, actually, we met in Amsterdam at the Bitcoin 2014 conference, yeah, that's, I think. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, our, our, our listeners will probably remember uh, your interview uh, that we did back then. And at that time, you were doing uh, this uh, really interesting and somewhat out of place, I found, uh payment terminal, I mean, out of place within sort of the Bitcoin space because it looked a lot like a, like a credit card payment terminal. And uh, I just uh, pulled out of my like, wall here, like this CoinKite card that you, uh, that you gave me. Um, the business has changed uh, since then, uh, as Brian mentioned, correct? Yeah, so, so the, the terminal was, was a little bit of ahead of its time. And, uh, and, and, what we realized was that the terminal was a much better exchange machine. And that's sort of like where all the sales of terminals have been. This is like people use this terminal because it's so secure and reliant that, that you can just operate a brick and mortar exchange to buy and sell Bitcoin. Uh, and that's sort of like uh, where we focus that part of the business. It's, uh, you know, resellers or uh, bigger companies come to us and they say, hey, I want, you know, 50 terminals and I want to put my brand on it and I want to use it to do remittance in Asia, for example. And, and that's how they use those terminals. Uh, I think that's definitely probably where you're... I mean, when I talk about CoinKai to people, they definitely mention the terminal, but uh, we're, we're learning that you guys have a, a bunch of other features that, that we can talk about. We, we can talk about the terminal as well uh, a bit later on in the show. Um. So yeah, tell us about uh, about the the enormous amount of features that you seem to have uh, so, on CoinKite. So we've always taken this approach of of not spending money on marketing and putting all the money in R and D because we really believe that it's so early in the Bitcoin space that we need to build infrastructure, right? And um, so so what we did is we we started with a wallet, right? A quality wallet. We 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 invented a, a Bitcoin HSM so that you could do transactions securely on server side. And um, What's an HSM? Can you... It's a hardware security module, right? So, so this is kind of, uh, for example, Tails or all these sort of security companies make these machines. But when we started out, there weren't any that could do the Bitcoin curve. Uh, so they couldn't sign Bitcoin transactions natively. And, and that's the only secure way of doing Bitcoin server side. Can you, can you explain a bit more about that? 
Uh, sure. How exactly sure. does that work, and why is that more secure than doing it some other way? So, okay, so it, it depends on your needs and threat levels, right? So, you know, your phone is more secure to you for small amounts, right? But, you know, your phone also has some vulnerabilities, right? And, and it's okay to keep spending money on your phone wallet. Um, it's also, you, you know, you also don't want to trust us with all your money unless you're using multisig where we cannot take your money, right? And, but the thing is, when you're processing signing transactions server-side, um, you need uh, a machine that can do that securely, right? You can't just use any kind of like plain computer or anything because those things are not meant to, to handle sort of like side channel attacks, cold boots, or uh, hackers trying to get in, right? D these machines are specially made to do cryptography on server side. Right, banks have been using these machines for like over thirty years to do their key signing for their domains or for you know other kinds of security things. It's just that they were not able to do Bitcoin specifically, right? So we had to create one that so that we could build Bitcoin the scale that we do. So, so is that how? So that those machines are online or are they offline? They are online, but they are kind of like black boxes, right? And Keys never leave them or never really see the light of day. So what happens is they, the keys are generated inside them, inside a secure element, right? And then when you make a call to them saying, hey, can you please sign this transaction? Here's my authentication, right? The machine knows it's you and then it signs the transactions, right? But, but the keys themselves never leave those machines. Okay, so it's somewhat similar to the secure elements that we now see appearing in mobile phones, like in the iPhone. Or, exactly. And now exactly. some Android phones. Yeah, yeah. which, which or, is or really like interesting. A, or, or like it's a making treasure. A lot of this, ex, yeah, like a treasure, yeah. Yeah. So, but this is done in secure, sort of like a server sort of level of transaction amounts, right? You, you know, when you have, you know, a lot of users and, and, you know, a lot of Bitcoins moving through per minute, you need sort of like a server grade thing that can do that securely. Okay, that's really interesting. So I, it seems like there's another thing that I wasn't, wasn't totally aware of that you guys are doing. Today's magic word is API. Head over to letstalkbitcoin.com to sign in, enter the magic word, and claim your part of the listener reward. It definitely seems you guys have, have evolved a bit because originally with the payment terminal that I think maybe most people know you for also because it's, you can take pictures of it and put that's it on right. websites, no, so that so people like to do that. Yes. Uh, and it, it seems, or it, my impression was of you guys that you had this really strong bet on mass adoption happening of Bitcoin like soon, right? And people start using it to pay their coffee because then obviously mm -hmm. this makes a lot of sense. And also the debit card you guys, uh, you guys created. Uh, I don't know if we've mentioned that yet. So um, how has the company evolved from there? And, and why did you choose to focus on, on that area initially? So initially, you know, what is the immediate reaction? It's kind of like, okay, great. So brick and mortar want to accept Bitcoin. What is the safest and easiest way of doing that? It's a payment terminal, right? I mean, it really is what most, that's why Visa and MasterCard chose those, 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 uh, those machines. It's because they, what, what a lot of people fail to realize is that when you're a business owner, you, you can't just give an app to your staff it needs to be something truly thought out. And that's why it took so long for payment terminals now to be tablets and those things, right? And it's still taking time. Um, but but um, that the machine is it's truly sort of resilient for a business, right? It can be dropped. You, you can't hack it. There's all sorts of reasons for that. Um, and it's but, a similar UI to what people are exactly. used to using with payment terminals. Yeah. Exactly. But we, are, we realize that those machines work much better, and especially because of their price point, for exchanges, right? So people buy and selling Bitcoin in person uh, on brick and mortar, 
they love those machines because you can print paper wallets, you can scan people's wallets. Uh, it's secure. They don't have to trust their staff. Uh, you know, it's GSM, so it works anywhere in the world. Uh, you can get robbed. You, you know, there's a, a, a lot of a lot of reasons for that. But uh, but as as you were mentioning, um, we we've noticed that because we had to build infrastructure for that, a lot of people wanted to take advantage of that infrastructure for themselves, right? So you know, our customers keep a lot of funds in our system because they know that we're using the same system to handle a payment network, right? So it was very natural for us to create a wallet that's for consumers and for advanced users too. Um, and now, I mean, startups are using that galore. Uh, and then what we did is for all those functions for the wallet, we, we enabled that as an API, right? And that's being an enormous success. So, so early on, um, you, you, you were sort of taking this bet of, uh, uh, I mean, when we met in Amsterdam, you, you specifically told us you were trying to become a Bitcoin bank. Um, right. And I, I think it was a mischoice of words. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, because the, the, see, we like to see ourselves as sort of like, a, 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 you know, an old school place where you can have your gold. You know, and it's on your name on it. We we never had IOUs, right? So CoinKite is fully blockchain. Everything that goes through CoinKite is on the blockchain. Yeah, which is why the term Bitcoin Bank kind of seemed at the time to me a little off-putting because I mean, even though um, the sort of services that you were trying to provide then perhaps were resembling those of a bank. In reality, like everything is on blockchain and uh, even more so now that you do multi-sig, you're not holding any customer funds. Can you talk about how the vision has evolved from there? Sure. So uh, I think that the, the misuse of the, the term bank came from the fact that we wanted to create something. Because see, like banks have, you know, a history of solving problems for people financially. You know, doing that well or not, that's a different conversation, right? But people have a certain familiarity with the understanding that banks are secure and that you know they you know their online banking they understand all those things right all those metaphors so when we build coinkite we try to to bring some of that in so it's not just like this new thing that's shiny right but it also has some of that inherent like security value to it that it looks like you know it does what it says it does um that's why our interface, it's, you know, it's not so shiny and, you know, full of like cute little things around, you know, we, we, we are a security company at heart. So with the debit card that you guys have issued, I thought that was sort of an interesting thing too, right? Because you could use the card and, and you know, you can pay with it with a terminal, uh, like one of the terminals and, you know, it would be super convenient because it's like directly deducted from your wallet and stuff. But of course, one of the problems with that, that product that, you know, sort of immediately apparent, right? You can only use the card, you know, with a coin card terminal. And, you know, if you guys have maybe a few hundred now, uh, you know, for most people, it's, it's not a particularly useful product unless you're have, lucky enough to be surrounded by people and uh, merchants who have that, which, you know, there aren't many. So, so one of, well, one of the things that I was thinking about, and I don't know if, if you guys have thought about that as well, well, would it be possible to create kind of an open standard uh, that, you know, anybody could create a terminal, uh, you know, a Bitcoin merchant terminal that then, you know, one could use any CoinCat card with, or also that the CoinCat terminal could accept these sort of debit cards from other issuers? Yeah, I mean, it, we've always been very open to that. Uh, but there is a larger barrier of entry for hardware sort of products. And, you know, a lot of the startups don't get into hardware, right? Especially smart cards. Um, but yeah, I mean, we've always been open to that. Um, what, what's really interesting is that, yes, it, it's not as available as, you know, like Visa is. But what, what happens is a lot of uh, people doing remittance with our terminals actually issue cards to the people who use their terminals, Right, and we actually make those cards customized brand wise for them. So, for example, there is this guy in Asia, he has uh, one terminal in pretty much like every island of South Asia, and he has cards with his brand on it. And 
he's literally offering the whole service to people by leveraging CoinKite on the back end. So his customers, when they go send money to their family in the other place, uh, they already have money in that card. So, so this guy is using, uh, well, he's offering this kind of remittance service in different islands in different countries in South Asia. Yes. And so does that mean, I mean, how does that exactly work? People pay him yeah, people in fiat cat, yes. to buy Bitcoins and then they get sent around. So, yeah. I mean, I presume you can only offer this kind of service if there's a Bitcoin exchange in, in each of those countries. And yes, and, and that's liquidity. happening, right? Yeah. That, and that's happening. I mean, I've been in talks with Unocoin as well. Uh, Sunny is a friend of ours. Um, you know, they're looking into dispersing Quenkai terminals in India. Um, there, is, there are terminals, you know, a bunch of them in Ireland. There's a bunch of them in Holland. You, you know, it's happening, but, you know, they're tracking the Bitcoin adoption as well. You know, Bitcoin adoption, you know, have peaks when it's all over the media because the price goes up. But, you know, it, it's going to take time. I mean, it took credit cards 30 years to happen the way it is now. You know, it started as a dining club. <laughs> and, and, you know, it's people, people need to understand that things take time. But what is, what is fascinating is the amount of startups coming up with way more novel ideas. And... Uh, you know, ha and I'm you know happy to to know that they're using our system to to do that. Yeah, it, it seems to make more sense than to than white label, especially in the exchange uh, scenario, to white label the machine, and in and it also seems to make more sense to be issuing these cards in that sort of remittance uh, model where you're going to have repeat business anyway. You're going to have the same people coming and using the same terminal all the time, and if they can have uh, their card in which they just keep uh, their bitcoins, then um, yeah, they're not. They're not going just to any any store to to buy anything. They're always coming back to the same uh, to the same terminal. You nailed it. That's that's exactly how they're using it. Let's take a short break to talk about our sponsors, Ledger, makers of the Nano hardware wallet. They offer the easiest way to keep your Bitcoin secure. It's basically a small device that you plug into the USB slot of any computer, and it allows you to send Bitcoins. And because the private keys stay on the device, this is secure even if the computer is malware infested or even if your IT guy is a certain not so trustworthy frappuccino loving Frenchman. So the Nano comes with a beautiful Chrome app wallet. I feel this is probably one of the best wallet experiences I've seen so far. It all just works together, especially with the two-factor app for iOS and Android. It makes you feel like your Bitcoins are in some bulletproof system. It looks great and it feels safe. And since we're talking about CoinKite today, it's a good time to mention, as we mentioned with Rodolfo, that uh, the Ledger now works with CoinKite. So you could use the Ledger as one of the signing keys in your multi-signature setup. So it could go show how Ledger is working hard to give you even more options to use their technology. So to get started, we have a special offer for you. If you head over to ledgerwallet.com and use the offer code EB09 at checkout, you get 10% off. So this offer code is valid until September 30th, 2015. Uh, they also just released a new uh, low-cost version of their Bulletproof Bubble uh, Nano. Uh, and that's obviously the same security and features, but at half the price. So Ledger Nano, smart card security for your Bitcoins, give it a try. We would like to thank Ledger for their support of Epicenter Bitcoin. And let's talk about the API. So, I mean, it, it sounds a little bit like that this sort of happened by accident, you know, that you guys just built so many features and then you decided to open them up to other companies and, and somehow there's been a really strong demand for those. Um, can you tell a little bit about what kind of startups are using this and in what ways? Sure. So... So what's funny is that before we actually wanted to get into terminals, we thought about offering Bitcoin as an API to companies, but then we kind of like, okay, this is too early. There's nobody <laughs> using this yet. We, you know, we kind of gone full circle. Uh, so what happens is startups and, and, and businesses wanting to do Bitcoin uh, have, been, have had this inherent problem, which is you know, keeping Bitcoin secure and making it easy for the whole organization to handle it. Right, and uh, so what we did is we got all the features that CoinKite offer. Right, so you know the multi-sig stuff, the send by SMS, the email uh, funds forwarding, 
uh, NIMS, everything, right? And we we made an API that that lets you access all those functions. So what happens is startups now don't have to build all that infrastructure that we already have, right, to do those things. And and startups are using this completely different. Some use just the wallet. Some use just the API. Some use the API with the wallet. Uh, so, for example, uh, let's say uh, Coinapult. Uh, Coinapult uses our co-sign API, right? So what they do is they have two keys that they generated, and it's on their servers, and we have one key. And then they access our system where the funds are stored to, to transact out, right? So if we cease to exist, they still have their money. We can't do anything about it. Um, for example, uh, BitRefew. BitRefew uses our API to, to transact the Bitcoins in smaller quantities because they let people um, pay for their cell phone bill minutes with, um, with, uh, with Bitcoin. And uh, they have a lot of transactions, right? So, so they use the API for that. Um, there are exchanges, uh, BitMEX, uh, Taurus Exchange. Uh, there's guys doing uh, other marketing agent stuff like uh, Block Trust. Uh, where they do uh, crowdfunding. Uh, oh, uh, there's Purse.io. They use our wallet. Uh, they don't use our API. Um, there are, there, there are, I mean, it's like every day I hear of a new one using our API in a different way. I, I think being able to offer all of our services and, and not constrain people to two out of three or three out of five for multisig, for example, we let you do any out of 15, uh, really sort of empowered people to come up with creative solutions, right? Um, for example, Bitcoin not bombs. Uh, what those guys did is very clever. They have, I think, like eight to 10 people in their organization. So they created eight keys in a multi-sig wallet. And then what they do is they do two out of eight. So anytime a person wants to take money out of the account, they need a second person of anybody in the group to authorize it as well. So it creates a lot of accountability for a nonprofit. That's, that's sort of, uh, some of some of the uses that people have. So, so going forward, do you guys uh, anticipate that you, you'll focus more on that API business and... and scale that or do you think you will continue to do offer like a really broad range of services you know ranging from terminals to wallets to debit cards to the api to and we have uh, more coming <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, we have lots more coming um I, I i think that we always had this sort of idea of you know build it we we are not so much as the lean mentality internally right we we do it slightly different we say, okay, great. We need this for... You, you just do everything, right? No, it, it's, it's more like <laughs> a, we think that, you know, if I need this internally, other people are going to likely need it for their businesses as well. So we go, we build it well so that it doesn't break, and then we put it out there, right? Because half of the problem when you're trying to do too many things is just kind of like handling bugs, Right. Um, so we try to like spend enough time building the feature and testing it so that we don't have to revisit it so much later. <laughs> and but that affords it, us. Yeah. Right. I mean, I, I think it's, it's pretty uh, amazing and astonishing, you know, cause, cause you guys really seem to be like anything you're building it from scratch and, and op offering it as products or API and stuff. And, you know, if you compare that to, let's say a company like BitPay, that is, I think about a hundred people. And, you know, they are, you know, they have some other things like the copay, multi-sig stuff, but, you know, it's pretty much one thing, right? Uh, and, and so that, that's quite amazing to contrast that. And, and it seems you guys def have definitely taken a very different approach to a lot of companies to try to focus on a niche and, you know, do a good job there. Y you guys are doing a really wide range of things. Yeah. I mean, we love that. <laughs> we just, we, you know... To me, there is no right answer yet. Um, we were kind of like, you know, see, some people think we're, we're like, you know, in the, in the sort of like 95 of the web. I think we're still in the BBS days for Bitcoin. I think it's so early, but so early that there is no right answer. So we just, we just want to 
build whatever people need. You, you know, like when people hit our support asking, hey, you, you know, I need this extra feature for, for you know, my API or I want them trying to do this. You know, we normally just have a meeting and say like, hey, you know, somebody needs it. Can we build it in a, you know, in a decent amount of time? Then sure, let's make it. Uh, we want to empower everybody to be able to build what they want to build with Bitcoin and not get robbed, right? Because so, that's the biggest problem. Right. And so another thing that's uh, special, I think, about you guys, besides the doing a really wide range of things, is that you haven't raised any investment. And, and as you know, we were chatting before the show a little bit, that you know also means maybe you haven't been as much in the headlines because the number one thing that you know is always on CoinDesk, if a company is raising money, you know, that's a great story. Um, why, why did you not choose to do that? And how has that been for you? So I think it's two things, right? We were fortunate enough to be fairly early movers in the space. So we have a significant amount of traction in our services, right? I mean, we have like over a thousand startups using uh, our APIs. We have, you know, like I think 160,000 active wallets. Um, you know, we have paying customers. You know, we believe in, in, in three things. It's, it's like security, privacy, right? And a sound business model, right? So I, I know it sounds insane in this market to have those very sort of, <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah we, we've never heard of that before in the Bitcoin space. That is, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you, know, we, you know, we have a free wallet yeah. and, and it's great. And, and if you use multi-sig, you can keep any amount of money in it. Um, but we, we really believe that in order to offer real privacy, like real privacy, like the privacy that I don't need to know who you are using my system. We had to do two things. We couldn't do fiat, right? So we could not be a money service business. I could not touch money because then I'd have to, you know, ID everybody. That's just the law, right? And I didn't want to sell customer information. I don't want ads, right? And there is something nice about just sort of like the craft of making a good product that people are willing to pay for, right? So what's nice is that when, when people start using our system, you know, they start with a little bit of money. And then we have customers that have been with us with like over a year and a half, you know, and they've been paying us, you know, $10, $30 a month for a year and a half because they, they really want to support what we're doing and they know the path we're taking. Right. And, and, you know, this support that we have from our customers and consumers, sorry, and, and the community is what, you know, make sure that we don't screw up privacy. Uh, Brian, I'm not sure I agree with uh, with you on CoinKite not being in the headlines, because every time I I, I often see you, 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 new features coming out, like CoinKite's not doing this, or CoinKite's partnered with uh, well, like Ledger, for instance, which we could talk about a little bit later, or CoinKite's doing these... Uh, um, what do you call the NIM pages? Or like, there's just I always see some sort of coin kite headline, and it just keeps bringing me back to when we first met. So I was curious. I mean, this is something I've been thinking about as as uh, in, in the last year and a, and a half. You know, we've seen the 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 use case for for multi sig really become really prevalent for a lot of uh, Bitcoin startups and. Simply from a security perspective, and also the sort of the idea that you know people should control their keys, etc. Uh, however, there are other companies that have a different approach, and they do uh, hosted wallets. You know, like there's obviously Coinbase and uh, and others uh, like like Circle, for example. Mm -hmm. um, where where do you see the, that going? Like, do you I, think I, that we'll consider to have that dichotomy, or I, I think. I think one of the most beautiful things about Bitcoin is the fact that we can have everything, right? And, and it's a true free market. It's, it's, it's something that there is, there is, you know, we need to educate people as to what they're getting into when they use a certain service or, or type of system, right? It's very important they make a, a, an informed decision as to what to use, but the, the nice thing is, you know, if people want to use a service that offers IOUs where you don't own the Bitcoin that, you know, you have, 
by all means, use it. And, you know, some of those companies do offer uh, sort of like other great things to, be, to Bitcoin, which is, you know, bring more users into Bitcoin or quickly sell them Bitcoin. Uh, now, what I find fascinating is that we actually end up getting a lot of those users after a few months. So a lot of people, when they get into Bitcoin, they go like, great, you know, there's this company that offers them Bitcoin, super easy to buy. And then they get into it. And then as everybody that gets into Bitcoin buys a tiny little bit, and then they get addicted to Bitcoin. <laughs> and then they want to know everything about Bitcoin. And then the obvious thing that comes to mind is, okay, great. Now I need to move my Bitcoin to a wallet in which I own the keys, right? And there is this very clear path of, of adoption where, where they go from the easy, where I buy, to then they go to, hey, great, I'm going to go to this multi-sig solution or I'm going to go to this phone app where I own the Bitcoin, right? Yeah, I, uh, I think that is, that is an extremely interesting point you're making. And I'm really curious and, and totally unsure whether that's going to continue to be the case, right? So because right now we still have people using Bitcoin who are, you know, technologically very savvy, who are well-educated, etc. So I, I think it will be one of the most interesting things and perhaps important things to see whether as cryptocurrencies get more adopted and as the people who start using cryptocurrencies are more just the sort of average person versus this, you know, very specific type of people, you know, whether they're actually going to have that same that same pull towards services where they control the private key or whether they're going to stay with the services that uh, can offer a better user experience because, you know, they uh, control the private keys and of they course. can just make it as easy as, you know, using Gmail. Well, I mean, that's one of the reasons why we still offer the custodian type of account as well, like the, the HSM only where we, you know, we can do stuff for people. And we're very clear to them that we will charge you money if you want to keep too much Bitcoin in this account type that we control so that we force people to use multi-sig via market forces so that they use multi-sig in our system and we don't control the coins. It's, we want people to move on to multi-sig. But it takes time, right? But, and, but also you do, but most don't, right? Like Coinbase is not trying to do that. Circle is not trying to do that, right? Yeah, they want I, I people to stay with their hosted wallets. It's, it's a motivation problem, right? I, I mean, most most. People, you know, they don't want to have to handle understanding their money, right? I mean, just, that's why banks exist the way they exist. But there is an awful lot of people in the world. <laughs> you know, there's 7 billion people. And, and I, I think there is room for everything. And what's nice is that when people get burned <laughs> because of, you know, losing money with a service that maybe has control over their keys... Um, they often don't do that again. Uh, and, and another thing, too, is that, I, I mean, in all fairness, the, the services that do uh, offer uh, what uh, Coinbase and, uh, and, Coin and Circle do, they will be legis legislated to death, right? I mean, those guys are going to have to soon... I, I, cannot, I, I cannot see we're going, uh, going too far without having to start offering FDICs, and, uh, you know, insurance over their stuff and, you know, having more government oversight. So I think what's going to happen is you're going to have two choices, right? You can own your own money and bear some responsibility for it, right? Where you have the, the, the multi-sig and we're going to help you make that as easy as possible, right? Including with like the, the ledger or something like that. Or you're going to let somebody else handle your money and rely on the government to keep them in check. And which kind of really happens, right? With like, you know, you, you can keep your money in your savings account or you can keep gold on your basement. <laughs> no, I, I think you're totally right. And I, and I think that's, that's going to be very interesting, especially as sort of the spit license thing is, is coming up, right? What are the repercussions going to be for the companies, uh, you know, like Coinbase that just can't avoid it? And so for, for you and CoinKite, because of the thing we just talked about, do you think you're going to have to shut down the custodian accounts at some point because um, otherwise you'll fall into the same uh, regulatory categories? I, I don't think that, at least for the foreseeable future, we're, we're going to have to just because 
the, the, the way it's set up is in a way that's auditable by the user and it's not an IOU system, right? There's a very big difference there and, and the user has notification systems and everything. Like we, we can't just move that money around, right? It's only you can move that money, right? We still need your password. And, and, you know, accounts, Coinkai takes a whole different approach. I mean, so, so when you do the custodian account, is it a little bit like blockchain or info that it's, um, it, it's not as far as that. And, yeah. and that's why, you know, we have the multi-sig stuff where we truly have no access to your funds, but, but our system is built in a very sort of like security focused way and privacy focused way where even each row of our database is encrypted. Right, so we, we can't even check your account name. Like it's it's a whole sort of like new way of doing things, right? Which you know cut through our our sort of uh, metrics and profits in a big way, right? We can't do queries in our system to know things about the users, or we can't sort of like we don't run analytics inside the site, right? There is literally no analytics within the logged in area. That's interesting. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's super fascinating, and I wonder if that's gonna, you know, if the if the pull of analytics won't be too strong for a lot of startups. It, it makes a huge difference, right? Because when you're trying to to grow your startup, <laughs> you know, one of the bigger ways you do that is by checking your numbers and say, hey, this works, this doesn't, and sort of optimizing it, right? Yeah. How do you? Um, how do you? Then how do you? How does that work we, for you? I mean, if you can't even, if you don't even know how people are using your service, we, we, you we, have we, to have you have to ask them, I suppose, right? Exactly, okay. and, and you know, we, we're one of the fairly few companies that, I mean, we have a substantial user base now, and and we still only get like ten tickets of support a day, kind of thing. Like it's very little because. We are actively talking to the users. People send us an email saying that there is an issue here or something that we immediately stop what we're doing and we go fix it so that we do not ever get an issue about the same thing. And then we also pull the users, you know, asking, like, you know, a lot of the users are our friends and we are part of the community. I mean, a lot of people know I'm on Reddit, <laughs> like, pretty much like live there. And uh, I, I mean, I, I read what people want and, and, and I want to have this conversation with them and, and, you know, people complain about something or they want something to go and we build it and people use it and then some of them pay for it. It's pretty simple. <laughs> so coming back, just, uh, I, was, I was curious about multi-sig. Um, I mean, it's, I, I guess say, so, I mean, I, I try, we've talked about this earlier. Um, uh, I, I use another multi-sig wallet and I've been, Personally, wanting to like use my ledger with some other wallet solution, like that's not um, a single single signature, and so you guys do that now. Okay, so I'm gonna go and try to get that set up. Um, but it seems like the the, the UX around getting multi sig uh, your multi sig setup is really complicated. I mean, and and it shows when you when you go on CoinKite. Although you guys do a really good job at like doing everything step by step, if you want to do a fifteen, like an end to fifteen multi sig, and have different types of um, uh, 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 of say so say you want like a hardware wallet on one key, and you want to have like a custodian account on another, and then perhaps you want to have like a key that somebody else holds uh, on another uh, one of those keys. The, the 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 UX to get that set up is going to be quite complex. Like, how do you guys plan to make that easier? Where do you see that going? So, it, I don't know when was the last time you checked, but it got substantially easier, right? I mean, so what we do is it's actually, uh, of course, there is some complexity to to multi sig, right? And the I mean, only way of making inherently it it's complex, exactly, right? Yeah. And and the the only way of making it truly easy is by making it less powerful, right? I mean, it's always a trade-off between powerful and easy, right? Um, we, we're letting, you know, some of other companies kind of do the ultra easy, less secure, right? That's not our business, right? Our business is it's private, secure, and, and, and sort of like quality, right? Um, 
it, it got substantially easier. Now, yes, it is step by step. So, I mean, all you have to do is, you know, create an account, you choose Bitcoin, you give it a name, and then, you know, it's going to ask you how many keys and how many of these keys you need to sign, right? And then on the next page, you literally pick what kind of key do you want for each key. So if you want to be super quick, you know, you just press simple, 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 and you're done, right? And we could have made it a little easier, but that would have made it, uh, you, we would have had to hide some education. We want to educate users, right? We want people to know what they're buying into. And that's why when you choose a key, beside each key option, there is a little explanation. And it says what kind of risk it entails. Because the nice thing is, for multi-sig, you only have to set up once. Right? So I think that, you know, like a lot of our users hold a lot of funds. When you're going to put your, you know, few thousand Bitcoin in a wallet, like, you know, I think it's worth taking five minutes to read through the options before you commit to it. And that's sort of the approach we have taken. You know, if you want to keep a few cents, great. Go use somebody else's wallet that, you know, has a cute app. And, you know, it's free and they, you know, know who you are and all the good stuff, right? Now, with us, it's different. If you want to know what's happening and, and you want to make sure it's secure, you know, it takes five minutes. Cool. No, I mean, I think uh, multi-sig, there's no question. I mean, before the show, we were just people looking at the site, which, by the way, uh, I, I highly recommend people uh, check out. There's a nice graph on there. It's called uh, p2sh.info, which uh, pay the script hash.info, right, which stands for the, the, the type of um, transaction you do with multi-sig. And, uh, and they show this, this a chart of how many Bitcoins are held in multi-sig addresses. And it's just crazy how that has gone up from uh, a year ago. It was literally uh, almost zero. And now it's uh, 1.2 million. So 8% of all the Bitcoins are held in multi-sig. And, and it's just, it's obvious that this is, uh, this is going to be the future because it's just so easy to have uh, a high level of security. I mean, from a UX perspective, maybe not so easy, but uh, it's, it's fairly easy to have a very high level of security, you know, even if people's computers are compromised. Uh, and, 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 and it seems like, so Brian, it seems like the, the UX seems to be getting better all the time because like, what, two months ago, we went through this whole setup to set up Electrum to manage our funds and like printing these paper wallets that I had to mail to you and everything. And I mean, now, you know, using, we, we could be using CoinKite and like these ledger um, um hardware wallets and like that whole thing just goes out the window it seems like every time we set something up well i mean we i mean people you you know using bitcoin there's always something like much easier it's just coming up right right, right i mean i mean i think the electrum setup is actually pretty easy but i mean if you if you think back to when i first used multi-sig was with armory <laughs> there were oh, lock yeah. boxes and there you'd actually have to you know like mail the transaction to someone as an attachment I mean, of course, the, the reason why they would do it like that is so that, you know, they literally have no involvement whatsoever, whereas Electrum, there's an Electrum server that you use. Um, See, I, I love this model of, of sort of um, having different trust uh, parties in, in, in anything so that you don't have to trust one solution, right? So for, you know... For, for the multisig, you can have a ledger, you can have multiple users. We're actually looking into uh, supporting Electrum as well. We're actually big fans. My first wallet was Electrum. Uh, I mean, right, of course, it was Bitcoin, you know, wallet. But when Electrum came out, I was like, yes, uh, <laughs> you know, this is so much better. And uh, I, I always loved Electrum. Uh, and uh, I, I really want to support it as part of the multi-sig and also a way for people to sort of uh, uh, redeem their funds in case, you know, CoinKite explodes. Um, because people do have a way of redeeming the funds, just, you know, a pain in the ass. So, so uh, then what you mean, so basically then uh, uh, an Electrum uh, seed could also, so like you could have another wallet uh, 
on CoinKite essentially. So exactly. one, of the, one of the other keys would be on CoinKite. Yeah, that's interesting. And, and vice versa too, right? So we would build the the P two S H, like the the multi sig wallet, and you because you already export, right? So when you create a CoinKite multi sig, you get an email with a backup, right? Uh, and and you know if you created your keys offline, then you already supposed to have those but you know it's a way for you to reload sort of the the, the reconstitute the wallet and send the funds out uh we would love to make it work with them like we made it work with uh, ledger so taking a step back a little bit from, from talking about features and multi-sig and stuff what's your vision for bitcoin where do you see this thing going in the next five years or beyond? so I, I i'm still that kind of person who gets sort of like 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 giggity like every time I make a Bitcoin transaction and I do those a lot of times a day, it always just puts a smile on my face. I, I, see, it, it's fascinating because I can pay my like my factory in China. I converted them to Bitcoin. Right, we convert everybody to Bitcoin. I've been I've been earning Bitcoin for the last two years now. <laughs> you know, I have very little fiat, and uh, so. Bitcoin adoption is happening. It's just that it's not on, you know, on, on this sort of like famous wallets or on, on exchanges. It, it, it's happening, but it's really through organic peer-to-peer. You can look at the transaction volume. It's growing so much. Every time there is a, a, a price movement, we see our system kind of like, you know, like the amount of coins going in and out just kind of like balloons too. Um, so it is happening. Right. I mean, I am able to sell my terminals to somebody in a country where there is a lot of credit card fraud because, you know, they pay me in Bitcoin. And, and this is happening more and more and more. Um, I think the major thing that's happening now is remittance is actually starting to happen. Right. We're finally figuring out proper remittance channels between countries because, see, before you had sort of like a a centralized entity like like Western Union, right? Where they have all the expensive business end too. They have the machines, they have the licenses in each country, you know, and the liquidity to move the, the funds around. What happened with Bitcoin is you have different companies doing each part of the bits, right? So one company is where you buy the Bitcoin, another company is where you sell the Bitcoin, another company is the one that handles the remittance, you know? So... You know, another couple of years, you're going to see an, an insane amount of remittance happening on Bitcoin. It's just that these dots are still getting sort of like traced together, right? I mean, what the guys, sorry. Yeah, and so I take it also that kind of means, so do you see Bitcoin also being used widely as, as a payment system and as oh, a for currency sure. to have, uh, you know, like our parents to keep Bitcoin and see I, I think that I, I think that there is this fallacy that you know like you know people who live in Silicon Valley have which is you know everything is easy and everybody's just gonna use the easy stuff and that's not the reality of the world right I mean people use different things in different places and I mean you know you look in some countries you know some merchants have literally five terminals on their counter People outside of very technologically developed areas understand that, you know, you will have different solutions simultaneously happen, right? I think, I I really think that people will use Bitcoin as Bitcoin is, as well as using sort of like fake Bitcoin, right? Like an IOU system or, or just dollars that use Bitcoin in the background. Today's show is brought to you by Shapeshift, the fast and easy way to trade all coins. Tell you what, go to shapeshift.io right now and check out the coins they just added. Gems, Storage Coin, Swarm, and Master Coin, which brings the total number of coins they support now up to 32. So you want to trade some old coins? You want to use Exchange to do that? What, do you still use Hotmail too? No, forget about it. Go to shapeshift.io and get it done in less than one minute with no account or sign up required. Here's how this works. You head over to shapeshift.io, you choose the currency you want to sell and which currency you want to buy. Let's say you want to sell some Litecoin to get some Bitcoin. And then what Shapeshift does is it provides you a Litecoin address. You simply send your Litecoins there. Shapeshift converts them for you. 
and puts the Bitcoins directly into your wallet. Super easy, super smooth. And if you like your altcoins, you will love their lens extension for Firefox and Chrome. What the lens extension does is it's a browser plugin and it allows you to spend altcoins wherever Bitcoin is uh, accepted. So let's say uh, you want to pay somewhere, a Bitcoin address comes up, uh, lens detects it, pops up a window. You then uh, choose which altcoin you want to pay with. You simply send out there, Shapeshift converts them for you and pays directly. I mean, it's super great if you like your altcoins, allows you to pay anywhere uh, with altcoins. And you can get that in the Chrome Web Store and Firefox add-ons. So go to shapeshift.io and put even more of your altcoins to use. We'd like to thank Shapeshift for their support of Epicenter Bitcoin. Just before we wrap up here, um, so you're, you're in Canada, um, and uh, I haven't been there in a few years, but I, I hear there's quite a few things happening there in the Bitcoin space. <laughs> Uh, can, can you talk a bit about the the scene in Canada? This is something yeah. that we always try so, to come back to when we talk to people from you know different places around the world. Like what's going on in your in your local area and in your country? So, so Toronto is an interesting place because we we have a history of fintech here. Uh, you know, lots of payment processors uh, for different industries, more non traditional industries, and. Uh, and, and the, Ontario is a great place to start a business because of the, the you know, tax here is super low for businesses. And uh, legislation is a lot more favorable. Uh, stock, uh, like when you, when you have a private equity firm, like a private equity company, it's a lot easier to handle all that stuff in Ontario. Um, so we, we sort of like have a lot of this, this, this pieces needed to start a Bitcoin company, like done well. Right, it's not too hard anymore to get a bank account for a Bitcoin business. There's, you know, there's always been exchanges here. Um, what banks are most favorable? I'm curious to to um, Bitcoin businesses. It, it depends, right? So if you are an exchange, is a whole different problem, right? Because you know they're concerned about cash flow problems and, and exchange problems, right? Now, if you're just a business that does Bitcoin, I. I there's, I, I have not heard of a bank closing a bank account because you are a Bitcoin startup. It's only if you're trying to buy and sell Bitcoin. But that's normal, right? That's like, if you are even advanced cash business, uh, banks will have, will take a, a closer look at your books uh, because they don't want to be exposed to it. Um, yeah, I mean, there's main four banks here, uh, BMO, TD, Scotiabank, and CIBC, and, and they all... They're fine. Um, I heard from Mars. Uh, Mars is sort of like a startup incubator, kind of half government-led initiative here. They're working on having some some cool announcements around the banking situation too. And what's the uh, what's the Bitcoin startup scene in, like in Toronto? Can you talk about some of the other startups that uh, sure that you see that? So um, there's a Quick BT and Spend BT. Those guys are really cool. So you can pay your credit card with Bitcoin without creating an account, right? And you can buy Bitcoin with your debit card up to a certain amount, of course, but without having any account. And so it's kind of like Shapeshift, but for literal fiat services, right? Uh, Jamie, very cool guy. Um, then there is Quadriga. It's an exchange here as well. Yeah, uh, those I guys, use them, yeah. Yeah, you, you can buy and sell gold on the exchange as, as on top of uh, US dollar and Canadian dollar. Um, I heard yesterday of uh, Big Gold being launched. Uh, there's the guys from PayCase looking at remittance. Um, there, is a, there are some connections with India through Sunny and Unocoin. Um, I don't want to forget anybody, but th there is a lot going on here. Um, I mean, the conference, we, we had a conference here, like I think like last year. And it, you know it was fairly packed, even we on, even though we only have you know six million people in Toronto, uh, things are happening, and we are you know like one fly away, one flight away from New York you know for forty minutes for an hour. And uh, is most of the startup activity happening in Toronto, or do you hear of any other like what, everywhere? Montreal, Vancouver, like what, what what's happening there? Do you have any so idea? Vancouver has a lot of Bitcoin adoption actually, which is kind of nice. Like in the city itself, right? You can go to a lot of establishments and pay in Bitcoin. Really? They doing yeah? They they do a great job there. The the Bitcoin Co-op uh, and and CoinFast, 
uh, they do a great job with adoption. Uh, I wish we did as much of a good job as they do here. Um, but there is quite a few startups there too. Um, there is even one guy there who buys and sells bullion, like real bullion, with one of our terminals in person. So he, he's been a bullion house for ages. Uh, so now you can actually go there with a quaint guy card and buy a bar of gold. <laughs> Cool. Okay. And, and any, any uh, clues what's happening in Quebec and Montreal or in the Maritime Provinces? I, just because I'm from New Brunswick, so. <laughs> right. Um, I, I, to be honest, I'm sure there are startups. I just, I'm just not super familiar with them. Um, and, oh, and then there is the guys. So in Montreal, there's the, the Bitcoin uh, embassy there, right? And, and those right, guys right, did right. a great job of adoption. And they just made that funny video with the guy in the, you know, pilot outfit of the Bitcoin symbol doing the airdrop for McGill students. Uh, that was really cool. Uh, and, and, you know, they, they have other things going on there too. Cool. Cool. Well, uh, Rodolfo, thanks so much for joining us today. It was, uh, it was a great pleasure talking with you. Oh, thank you for having me. I mean, it's, it's, it's nice to get, uh, to get to talk to you guys. You get, you guys do some, some awesome work. Um, Thanks, and it's it's nice to talk to you because you're it's it, you're so you're so passionate about it. I mean, when you're talking about about your about your startup and just Bitcoin, it's like you know, you see that it's something that you're really passionate about, and I, I think that's uh, that's really uh, that's really great. I listen. It's Bitcoin. It's, it's, it's you know, it's a society changing technology, right? And we don't get to have many of those uh, come by often. No, that's very true. Yeah, well, so thanks so much, Rodolfo. If people want to check out uh, CoinKite, you can go, you can do that on coinkite.com. So that's C-O-I-N-K-I-T-E.com. And of course, we'll have the link in the show note. And yeah, to our, to our listeners, thanks so much for joining us today. So we release episodes every Monday. And, you know, you can subscribe to the show on iTunes, on SoundCloud, or in your favorite podcast app for Android or iOS. Or if you prefer video, you can do get our videos on our YouTube page which is youtube.com slash epicenter BTC and of course if you like the show then you know we would certainly appreciate a tip and you can find the address in the show notes so uh, thanks so much and we'll be back next week